everyone, welcome to Wildwood yet again. Uh, my name is Holly, I'm one of the senior keepers here at the park. Um, you've joined us on a really nice sunny day and we're at the Otter Pond today, so we're going to be talking about uh, some mustelids and we've got our, one of our conservation team and one of our keepers to be chatting to you. Um, just to kick it off, thank you ever so much everyone that has been donating, fundraising and supporting us. Uh, quick update about Noah, who I mentioned last week, who's the little lad that's doing his normal walk to Wildwood. He's got one mile left. So come on, Noah, we're all behind you. Keep going. One mile is nothing, that's easy. Um, but thank you ever so much for all your hard work so far. Um, as I said, thank you to all of our supporters. Um, and we're really, really hoping we can welcome you back pretty soon. Um, so watch this space. So that uh, kicks off to our first guest, who is Suzanne, who is one of our conservation officers. So hello, Suzanne. So Suzanne is basically our mustelid expert, so you know all things mustelid, pretty well, most things mustelid, most things British mustelid anyway. Um, how are you? Yes, very well, thank you. You're good. Um, so mustelids, for those people that don't know at home, they probably know what one is, but not about the whole group, right? Because it's quite a large group. Yes. Um, so do you just want to briefly explain the types of mustelids that people at home would know, and then what we would get here in the UK as a native animal? Yep. So, uh, mustelids are a family of, of carnivores. Okay. There's about um, 60 species worldwide. Wow. Um, the thing, they tend to all be the same sort of shape, sort of long, thin bodies and short legs. And they've all got five toes, front and back. The main thing about them is they're quite a smelly family. <laughs> so, they have sort of scent glands under their nice. tails. Yes. So, hence the word must. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they use um, so they'll use it to either scent mark each other, like the badgers do, or, or scent mark their territory, or they use it as a stink oh. defense, <laughs> like, like the whole cat. So that's the thing that kind of um, binds them all together. Cool. Hello, Loki. Oh, so we, we are going to be feeding yes. the otters. Um, we do have one of our keepers on standby to come and feed the otters. This is Loki. He's one of our uh, residents, um, and he's the male. Uh, Freya's still in bed, um, but Loki is getting involved in the chat. <laughs> Hello. Oh, very cute, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, as always. So he's a mustelid as well, right? So he is a mustelid. So we have eight species in the UK. Okay. You can see ferret. Yep. And um, he's one of those. And um, weasels and stoats, probably um, people will know about. Polecat is a bit more unusual. Okay. Um, people might not have heard of the polecat. Hi Martin, I think, is raising its profile. Yeah, definitely. And, um, so it's more more well known now and then of course you've got the badgers and the otters and the ferrets um, of course which are domesticated cool and the american mink is the non-native ah so the american mink is the invasive so they it's, shouldn't be here but they, they are shouldn't here. be here cool here. okay yes so do we want to i think loki wants think his breakfast, loki wants breakfast. Um, so should we get Stuart on so Stuart is one of his keepers we will be hearing from suzanne in a minute we're just going to give loki his food because I think he's pretty keen for it. Um, so this is Loki and he's yes. one of our he's our boy here, isn't he? Yeah, he is our boy. He's uh, hungry. Yeah, you're hissing at me. I'm not going to make you wait any longer. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've got a male and female pair here at Wildwood. Yep. Loki and Freya are female. Uh, they both they're both three years old. Okay, so quite young then, really. Fairly young. They they should be mature now. Um, so some point we are hoping to have babies, but they've just got to work out what they're doing. Uh, Is he very good at bringing the chocolates and the flowers and doing all the wooing or not really? Uh, he's, he, he does he does take a bit, bit of interest in prayer and does some of the right things, but he, he's a bit of a selfish boy. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> they, they don't really uh, share their, their hope anymore. Um, but when they did, he'd take up a lot of the space and would kind of squash fire. <laughs> he's a, a bit. bit. He's a bit bigger than her, isn't he? Quite yeah, he is. He is a bit. He is a bit more chunky. Good uh, boy. I'm sorry. Are you waiting? I'm waiting. Oh, so he's okay. making a lot of noise there. Is that quite common? Do they have quite a few vocalizations or? Um, not really. So, it, what, I don't know how well you can hear it on on the microphone here, but anyone who's gone to park might have heard him making that sort of raspy noise before. Like a... Yeah, that's all. <laughs> 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 um, that's all they really do. They're not of other species. They're not terribly social, so yeah. they don't really talk to each other much, which is why they don't have a lot in the way of squeaking vocal cool. interactions. So, but you have learnt to do that to get my attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, 
He loves his food, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Uh, he can eat for England. So Never Freya's really obviously quite food. a bit smaller, and she she comes out when Freya wants to come out, doesn't she? Yeah, she's very um, different. She to doesn't. She doesn't really come out for breakfast. <laughs> she's more interested in naps than she is in breakfast. Nice. Yeah. It's a good good way of life, really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but they get along really well. Yeah. Good. So hopefully in the future, once they sort of work out what they're supposed to be doing in terms of courtship and baby making, we'll we have may have some little tiny waters. little raspy machines. <laughs> raspy fish eaters. <laughs> so, uh, do they just eat fish, or do they get anything else? I mean, otters are famous for for their fish eating. Yeah, and it does make up a large part of their diet. I think I fell. Uh, but they do eat other things. Uh, so here at the park, we the main things we'll give them are, as well as three different types of fish, we'll give them three chicks. different types of fish. Yeah, wow. just here. Um, we'll give them chicks. We'll give them rat pups and rats. Now, those aren't necessarily the type of thing that would eat in the wild. It's sort of uh, close parallels to what they would be in the wild right. that we can easily acquire. Yeah, that's true. Um, as long as they, their nutritional needs are met, though, right? Yeah. So the chicks would be a close uh, sort of a, a close match for waterfowl that they might get. Okay. So you don't get yeah. many chickens at the riverside, but <laughs> things like more hens. And more yeah, likely definitely. to get. They're not going to pass up an opportunity to grab one of those, are they? And rats, you're more, it's more likely to be uh, something like a bowl. Right. Oh, he's chomping away on that, isn't he? Yeah. So what's the type of fish you're feeding him today? If we give them three types of fish, what's So that? these are the ones that they get the most. Herring, uh, the sort of mid-sized ones. They also get sparling, which are tiny little things, only about an inch long. And... Occasionally, they will also get roach, which are quite big and much bigger than the, the herring. Um, and, you know, whereas Loki's pretty much already eaten that herring, I've just threw to him. <laughs> he doesn't even chew much. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> even Loki will take a few minutes on the roach, so it's yeah. a little bit longer. Look at him go. Yeah. Maybe. So, how many times a day are they fed? The otters are quite active, aren't they? Well, Loki's quite active. Yeah, um, um, so they get three feeds a day. So breakfast feed, uh, the, the midday feed. When we have our talks going on, that's the that's the second feed that they get that get then during the talk. And the third feed we generally put in just before we get go home, so it's as late as possible. And those feeds are spread out as much as possible. And that that third feed is generally the heaviest one, the biggest one. Uh, because it's when Freya's most likely to come out. <laughs> uh, she, she's, she fairly, she's fairly good at coming out for, for lunch. <laughs> but yeah, there are times she still just she just doesn't want to. Right, last one, Loki. Go along. He'll probably join us for the rest of the tour, oh, or some of the that's tour, in the <laughs> until he realises that we've got no more food left. So that's him done then. Yeah, that's him done for the Thank time. you very much, Stuart. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> cool. So we're going to bring Suzanne back now. We're going to talk about more of the conservation aspects of mustards and what we're doing here at Wildwood and in the rest of the UK, potentially uh, in the future. Um, so we had, uh, I think we had a question last week um, from someone that, or yesterday, um, that kind of started this conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, so from Julia. So Julia asked on Facebook, is there an active programme for the reintroduction of pine martins alongside squirrels in the UK, red squirrels? in the UK and that's quite a hot topic isn't it? It is quite a hot topic yeah yeah so um, I mean pine martins are a kind of good news conservation news story yeah um, at the moment and yeah so they their populations declined in the past through persecution and also through habitat loss so okay. they used to be um, our most abundant carnivore. That's crazy, isn't there. it? Because they're so restricted now. They're so restricted, and that now, yeah, they're our second rarest carnivore. But yeah, a lot of work has been going on for the pine martin, and they are now a protected species. Good. So that has helped with the, with the persecution. Um, and what is also helping are um, pine martin reintroductions or right. translocations. So that is actively going on or has that in recent years? That is actively going on. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so 2015, this was sort of led by the Vincent Wildlife Trust. Right. They um, had a project, they were translocating pine martins from Scotland to Wales. Um, mm -hmm. It was over three years. Um, 
It's about 50 animals all together in that three years in, the, in Scotland where they were doing well yeah. to Wales. So they did all the surveys to check that the populations in Scotland could, could cope with, could cope with that animals. sort of yeah. removal. <laughs> and yeah. That's what you don't want to do, is it? Is, exactly. Is take animals out from an, an, an unstable population and then create the same problem somewhere else but we didn't have to yes. worry about that because all, all the science had yes. been done and it was yeah. all done under licensing <laughs> and everything so um yeah and, and over the three years and the pine martins are now pretty well established and they're bred apparently every year wow. since they were released so Outrageous. it feels like a really good positive story and then more recently um this is quite exciting for me my, my colleague vicky yeah. um, <laughs> we went to help out um with the project that was happening in the forest of dean so this okay. was with the help of Vincent Wildlife Trust, but led by Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust this time. And so it's a collaborative project. It was a collaborative project, um, and the two project officers... That would be lovely to have baby otters. Mm. Hi guys, I think we're back. So sorry for that. Um, it's only our second technical issue that we've had on these live streams, which I think is pretty good, considering we're in the middle of a woodland. Um, so if you've only just joined, Hello, uh, please chuck in any uh, questions you have on our comments. We will be getting to them. Uh, but I'm chatting to Suzanne, who's one of our conservation officers, uh, but she's also our resident mustelid expert. So she's telling us all about uh, mustelids and conservation of mustelids in the UK at the moment. Um, for those of you that have just joined us, we were just chatting about pine martins and how they're, the aim is to bring their numbers back because they are currently really restricted just to sort of Scotland and Wales uh, at the moment. Uh, but they've also got quite an interesting relationship or uh, yeah a key relationship with with the conservation of red squirrels haven't they so did you want to yeah carry on before yes. the internet goes again about that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so research has shown that um, and this was in ireland first of all um, when pine martin started to spread out their, from their um, range that um, gray squirrels started to disappear um, and as a consequence, we think the red squirrel population oh. started to increase. So there was a positive correlation of pine martins and red squirrels, and a negative one with pine martins and grey squirrels. Right. But what we don't know is how this actually happens, whether pine martin is predating directly on the greys, or whether there's a change in behaviour. But I mean, and, and right, so like just the, the sheer presence of pine martins yes. in an area could deter greys. Could right, potentially. okay. And also because um, the red squirrel and pine martins have evolved together, yeah. it's thought that the red squirrels have evolved, you know, the anti-predatory um, behaviours. And yeah. there's some evidence to show they're kind of more alert when they smell pine martins than the grey right. squirrels are. Yeah, the so they know what to do. A, a sort of American, they haven't evolved with the pine martin, and so they're like, oh. No. What is that? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? And then potentially it's yeah, too late. It's too late. Cool. Okay. But it, it, we still don't know exactly how it's happening, so we're kind of so still, more research is still needed. Yes. But it looks promising it looks, for the bounce back of, of Pine Martins if, yes. if they can bring red the ginger squirrels back into it as well, because <laughs> everyone loves the redheads. <laughs> <laughs> Um, quick shout out to everyone that's commenting, especially Jackie. Um, I've been told to give a, a special shout out to Jackie, so hi Jackie. Uh, we've also had a um, question about the otters um, from Laura Ann. So she's asking if these otters are native and how rare are they and can we see them in the wild in Kent? Okay, so, so these are the Eurasian otters, right. so they are native to the UK. In fact, they're a species which has got the largest distribution of any mammal. Actually. Really? You get them all over Europe, in Asia and in Africa as well. So that's three, so three continents, isn't quite it? Quite amazing. Yes. Oh, cool. But they are native to the UK. We do only have one species yep. of otter. Um, and what was the other part of that question? If, uh, how rare are they and, how, and can we see them wild in Kent? Right. So again, otters is a positive conservation story. Okay. So for otters in the UK, um, their population started to decline dramatically in the 1950s. Okay. And it was found it was actually used for um, organic pesticides, things like DDT, which were used in sheep dips, yeah. um, to, to kill insects actually getting into the river systems. Oh. And into the fish, which you know, the otters eat. So you just get this build up of toxins, right? build up in the food chain, and otters, unfortunately, 
come into this, yeah. populations fell dramatically. And but it's of course when we found out that these were poisonous to the otter, then they became banned, and the otter received full protection. And right. That was about sort of late seventies. So otter got protection. It's been a very, very, very sort of slow recovery. Right. Um, but now um, the numbers are about sort of eleven thousand, we think, okay. in the UK. And in the nineties, they were about seven thousand. So they are increasing. So it is an increase. And am I right in saying they're in every county now? They are in every county. So proper success. So they are even in Kent as well. It's all kind of top secret where they Yeah, are you can't really Kent. get the location yes. spot on because, um, yes. yeah, you don't really want to risk disturbing them, do you? You don't want to risk disturbing honest. them, yeah, because it's a kind of a, a vulnerable time for yeah. them. So we want to give them... Um, and they're so the best, secretive anyway, aren't they? The best chance possible. Yeah, but yes. they are in Kent. Um, yes. So the biggest indicator is normally... I mean, with the zookeeper, so I'm going to talk about poop. Um, it's their spray, isn't yes. it? Yes. Um, as Suze was saying earlier, all mustelids have that strong smell. Um, and so they leave their spray in, in latrines or in particular points in their territory, right? Yeah, so what the otter likes to do, because they, they're a sol solitary animal yep. um, and they live spaced apart, um, they <laughs> like... The spray is basically like leaving a message okay. for another otter. <laughs> Um, and this research has shown there's been like a hundred different scent components Hello. in one particular spray. So there's well, a lot going on there. Yeah. You know, we, we don't know, you know what they're saying, but there'll be communication going on maybe if a female's ready for breeding, things like that. Yeah. Maybe it's a male saying keep out, this yeah. is my territory. So what they want to do, because even the otters don't come across each other very often, is make sure that spray is in a, a spot which is very, very visible. Right. So in fact that, that helps um, conservationists who are surveying for otters because it means that they can actually find spray right. quite easily in bridges or one of those places where otters like to spray and so there's actually surveys done on bridges know, on bridges to, to find otter poop. Yes. So that's probably the most you're gonna see of otters is their, <laughs> is their is poop. poop yes. But it's still a good a good successful viewing. Yes and it will be yes and it has a kind of unique aroma, a little bit fishy Jasmine tea. Some oh, see, say. I've smelt it. Wild otter poo, not these guys. And it smelt like fresh mown grass. Yes, yeah, so it's not unpleasant. Is yeah, it? it's not nasty. No. Um, unlike badger poo. Badger poo. <laughs> yes. Yes, that can be a bit more unpleasant. Can't yeah. It? So we do have badgers here at the park as well, don't we? Um, but uh, in terms of conservation, badgers have already had a lot of protect protection put on them in legislation, haven't they, in recent years? Yes. Um, so in terms of declines. Are we worried about them? Actually, no. Badgers okay. seem to be um, doing, doing, okay. doing really, really well. Well, that's yes. good news. So, yeah, <laughs> it is really good news. I mean, and, and even um, so, the news of the, the badger call now, the government has decided they're going to start phasing out the badger Right, call, yeah, so that, that is big. And stop to vaccinate the badgers instead for TB. Which so is that's much, much better, yes, isn't it? It makes much more sense. True. It? Yes, but yeah, badgers, so the estimate is nearly 400,000. Wow. You know, in, in, yeah, so, you know, a lot really, of badgers. Really good. The other probably most seen mustelids for our viewers, again, if you've got any questions that you want to know about any specific species, chuck them in our comments. I do have a team around me writing them down. Um, but the, the ones that people most are most likely to know are stoats and weasels. Yes. But they're probably one of our smallest. Yes, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> so um, there are a couple of differences, but I know I have got confused between them. Um, so did you want to explain the differences and how yep. you can tell a stoat from a, a, a weasel? Yeah, so yeah, so the weasel is the smallest carnivore actually and its name, Mostella, comes from Mus, the mouse. Okay. Um, so, and it's actually, it, it is like a stretched mouse. Oh. Um, hi. Oh, we have, have stuff. <coughs> wow. I don't know if we can, uh, he's not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a second camera. <laughs> So this is, a, this is a weasel skull, and it's just that is tiny, to show it? you um, how small a weasel actually is. Because I know <laughs> when we've had weasels at Wildwood, people are really surprised at how small. Yeah, um, I think you they because are. in pictures they look like ferret size, right? Yeah. But they're tiny. So there is an old, old folk tale that says that weasels should be able to fit through a wedding ring. And you think, well, when wow. you see that skull, it would. You think if it was, if it was a female weasel, because females are smaller than the males. Okay. You think that actually could could be possible. So, 
So yeah, so weasels generally are smaller than stoats, but you have to be careful because you might get a large male weasel oh. and a small female stoat. <laughs> of course. So you can't just go by size right. alone. Um, the other thing to look for is the coloration maybe. So weasels tend to be chestnuty brown and stoats more sandy brown. It's still very vague. Again, isn't it? it's a bit vague. <laughs> now, if you have a good close-up shot of okay. a weasel or a stoat, um, the other thing that you can look for is the line between the back fur and the belly fur. So, like along their side. Along their side, and this is quite nice because on a stoat, it's straight, and on ah. a weasel, it's wiggly. Okay. So you okay. can kind of it's a good way to learn it. Yeah. Um, but the main thing, and the thing probably that you're, you're going to see if you do see a weasel or a stoat is when one of, you know, it's just probably going to be a flash yeah. across the road. <laughs> and the question that you ask yourself is, did you see a black tip to the tail? Okay. The stoats have quite a large black tip right. to their tail and that is very visible. Only weasels, stoats have the black tip. Only stoats have the black tip. And weasels have got quite a short tail and so you wouldn't, yeah, you don't see the tail at all. That's good then. So that's so black tip to the tail yes. and it's a stoat. No black tip and it's a yes. But they're very, very secretive. Um, you're very, very lucky to see. So is that is that a trait as well of, of mustelids? They try and stay out of the way and they're quite shy and secretive as a whole, as a group? Yes, generally, I think they do want to keep out of, out of the way of, of humans. Yeah. Um, although, if you, if you are lucky enough to see, say, a weasel or a stoat in the wild, there is, this is why I like mustelids so much, they have, I feel like they have a curiosity yeah. about us as well. Um, and you know, when I've had sightings of them, and I've sat really still, I found that they've come back to have a look, yeah. just to check. You know, because I'm not usually in that space. So right. like, what am I doing? And I, I kind of feel that they're quite interested in me. I don't know. Um, well, that's quite that's nice as well, isn't it? To yeah. feel like they, you're getting that interest back yeah, from those wild, wild, uh, like wild they've got wildlife sites. Lots, lots of character. I know the so I work with the pine martins at the park, and the pine martins are a very sort of shy. Um, shy animal but even they will if you stay in their enclosure too long or you do something different they kind of stop and have a look and they're like oh what are you at? what are you doing down there or what have you got they're always interested in, in the food and uh, yeah what good stuff we're bringing do we have questions thank you very much oh a couple of questions uh this is from julia tim sponsored smeagol we miss her and oh you sponsor the ants now who was smeagol Oh, Smeagol was our weasel. Oh, that was our weasel. And she was oh. actually brought into us um, probably about six or seven years ago. Um, a lady brought her in. Um, she'd found her as a baby. Wow. Um, I think the nest had been disturbed. I think the, the, the field was being harvested yeah. and the nest had been disturbed. And so my colleague Steve um, is, is Hi, Steve, uh, <laughs> you're watching. He does a lot of hand raising of animals and wow. he, he took her home and uh, she became his baby and yeah he had raised her <laughs> amazing and then of course when she got a little bit older and um, she came back to Wildwood and we had an enclosure here and she she was always hand tame and he was always her, her dad so he would go in and, and they never her. forget do they they never, never, they forget, never forget no no um, oh yeah. lovely because I used to go in with her as well but she's always a little bit more wary with me and with, with Steve you know, she was, that was dad wasn't it was I dad. guess yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, but yeah the tend to only live sort of five or six I suppose for an animal that small, you're not going to expect a long life, no, are you? Yeah. Um, and then I have a question from Matilda in Cornwall. Um, how many otters do you have at Wildwood, and how many animals in total at Wildwood? Mustelids or all animal species? I'll leave my team over here to add everyone up. <laughs> um, so we talk about the otters. So Loki's gone in at the moment, uh, but we have two, don't we? We have a male and a female uh, otters. <laughs> Um, we haven't bred them yet, but they're still quite young, so they're still kind of finding their feet. Uh, but hopefully, in, yeah. in years to come, we'll have some otter kits or otter cubs. Do we have a total yet? <laughs> we're, work <laughs> we're working on the total, Matilda. Um, so, what else about our mustelids here at the park? So we don't have weasels, do we, anymore? Uh, no. We have badgers, we have otters, we have pine martins. Um, one of the things that would be impressive would be the biggest mustelid, right? Oh, yes. Um, so it's not just an X-Man. There is an actual <laughs> animal called a wolverine. Um, do you know how big they get? So you're saying about the weasel, that skull is like 
the size yes, of a wedding ring. So the weight of a Have weasel them. is possibly maybe 60 grams, whereas a wolverine can be up to 25. 25 kilos. kilos? That's like a medium dog, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so not, that's not to be same. messed with. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and where do they come from, in the, those those big guys? Where do they come from in the wild? So they have a northern European distribution. We okay. used to have them in the UK, okay. probably about 8,000 years ago. <laughs> so you could maybe class them as, as native. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, so northern European distribution and sort of quite Scandinavian countries like Norway and Finland and then cool. Canada. So, so it just goes to show how you know we've got this huge group of animals that are all classed as mustelids and they've all got very different lives haven't yes. they so you've got this huge array and variety of sort of living up in the trees so you've got the pine martins that are arboreal you've got the ones underground which are your badgers and your sort of polecats and then you've got the wolverine which is just a, a brute and then you've got ones that are living in the water so they've managed to infiltrate yes. every habitat yes. and every situation so they're a pretty they're cool pretty group good. aren't they absolutely very successful and um, do we have a total 15. 15 for, different for Mr. oh different Mr. mustelids but 15 mustelids total we've got 15 mustelids here at the park in total um and we have more questions uh so this is it from anita hi anita how are the bears doing <laughs> <laughs> they always infiltrate the live streams don't they bears are doing yeah. very well they're enjoying the sunshine this morning weren't they having a good wrestle yeah they were having a big play fight this morning actually yeah like enjoying a rough and tumble but they're happy enjoying the sun um so yeah they're doing very well thank you very much um laura ann has asked so as a group are mustelids intelligent Absolutely. i know what my answer yes. would be <laughs> Absolutely. yeah yes. they're really clever yes because they've got to problem solve right and i think any carnivore has got to have some kind of intelligence because it's got to work out how it's going to kill its prey yeah um and then also with social animals like the badger is a social mustelid yeah and you think there's got to be intelligence communicate to communicate interaction exactly. in general isn't interaction. it interaction yeah yeah i mean i've worked with otters before as well and the intelligence from those guys it, they you can see loki down here with with stuart earlier he knows exactly where his food's coming and he's telling him to hurry up and yes. um, there's no waiting around they know exactly what they want and how they're going to get it um yeah i'd definitely say they're really intelligent yeah probably more intelligent than some cats <laughs> <laughs> I think, anyway, and the pine martins as well, when, when you've got a seasonal, op omnivorous animal, because not all of them yes. are strictly carnivorous, no. are they? Um, so they have to be able to find food at different times in the year and from different sources, I guess. So Absolutely, yeah, that's a good point, to yeah, be able to do so that. They do, they do change their diet Yeah, with the seasons, yeah, so they can be eating sort of small mammals um, one time of year, and then in the autumn they'll be switching to, to fruit, um, so to berries, yeah. and maybe nuts. So is well. that just following what is most abundant at that time? Yeah, they, they, they're very opportunistic, I yeah. think. So they will, yeah, they will eat food that's available at the right time of year. I think that wraps us up, really. Um, if you've got any other questions, guys, um, please chuck them. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> please chuck them down in the comments. Um, and if uh, we'll probably, we are doing one next week, right? We're doing a live stream next week. Um, the subject is yet to be confirmed though. Thank you very much for uh, Suzanne for joining me today. Give her a nice round of applause everyone. Um, like I said at the beginning, thank you so much for supporting us. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. And we're just looking forward to welcoming everyone back through our doors, hopefully very soon. Uh, but if not, see you next week and see you very soon here at the park.